It seems, everywhere you turn, information about our planet's changing climate surrounds us. Is it a natural cycle, solely a man-made cause, or a combination of the two? Many say that there is this need for action. Others think that the end is coming, so why fight for the future? But you just start noticing things, you know, people talking, newspapers, uh, news reporters just talking about something weird about the environment. So I, guess. I have to say that some of my business associates have said that they've seen studies that this is just a natural progression throughout history. This has happened again. If man isn't responsible for global warming, then what is, I think, was the real question. What fate, intended or unintended, have human beings created for the future? This global warming is unequivocal. Temperatures have risen 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit in the past century. 11 of the past 12 years are among the warmest since 1850. The emissions of greenhouse gases grew 70% from 1970 to 2004, and human activity is largely responsible for the warming. The, the evidence is, is very clear that we humans are having a major impact on global climate change. In the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it brought together 37 countries, it brought together more than 2,500 scientists, and there is not only consensus, there is virtual unanimity among all of those scientists that global climate change is occurring and that humans are a major driving force. While most of what we hear tends to be a bit on the scary side, people well versed on this topic of climate change discuss both sides of the issue. And also I'd just like to throw in, even if it is part of some cyclical pattern, some weather induced things, oh, the world's got very cold, yes it has, it's got very warm, yes it has, but if some natural warming trend occurring, naturally, why would you put a febrile patient in the sun? Why would you add to that? The question becomes, to what extent is it driven by human activities rather than, than nature? There may still be time to act, just how much time is the driving question. Yes, there are problems, and they are real. We have much to do, and we have to take action. Now it's come down to us, individuals, hundreds of millions of individuals who need to change our attitudes and our behaviors and how we treat waste. Never before in the history of mankind has so much been happening on our planet. Our modern lifestyles are made up of consumption, and we're consumers on every level. Oil is the catalyst allowing for these modern luxuries. And constant media bombardment encourages non-stop consumption. But is it possible for us to curb our behaviors in order to preserve our planet for future generations? If there was a lot of recyclable material in there, it'd be hard to recover. Um, but even, you know, as you look at the pile, you see that there's material in there that's recyclable. There's wood, there's cardboard and whatnot. So if people were to take the time to put that material in the right container, it would be a lot easier to, to recover that material and recycle it. Whenever there's a discussion about our changing climate, there's always a ticking clock in the background. This ticking clock fascinates me to no end. It always presents some sort of foreboding ending. Do we all really believe the threat of global warming is real? Who's currently taking action and leading the way? What does current science tell us? And is there a spiritual connection to the planet that we're losing? Or have we lost it already? What we have missed is dominion in the Old Testament doesn't mean dominance. It means responsibility. All of these questions about the fate of the planet and the fate of humanity have spurred me to take action that may be seen as a bit extreme to some. I'm about to cross the southern tier of the United States on a bicycle. Who am I? My name is Jeff Hyland, and I'm a young producer living in Southern California. My motivation for this might seem surprising to some, but not for others, depending on their proximity to cancer. In 2001, my dad was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. A few years after that, my brother's girlfriend was diagnosed with colon cancer. Whether the cause for their cancer came from polluted environmental conditions around them or something they are genetically predisposed to are questions I may never be able to answer. But knowing someone with cancer isn't an anomaly these days. 
either is living with polluted environmental conditions right in our own backyards. This is my drive. This is my motivation. I want to know how different communities are working to clean up their unique environments. Is the motivation for these actions to preserve the planet or is it to preserve human health? I hope to discover this and more on a cross-country bicycle ride through the southern tier of the United States. I'll need a partner in crime for this epic journey. Mike, who's been my friend for over 12 years, has agreed to bike with me. Adventure and experience are what he is all about. Speaking as a narrator isn't so much his thing, so he's agreed to help me film the journey we have before us. But before we take the first pedal, we're gonna require a few things. Clearly, we're gonna need bicycles. Add a trailer for some room to add in cameras and microphones. Camping gear, definitely required for a trip like this. A bunch of bungees, maps, and a whole lot of water. That should do it. Now all we need to do is pick a day to start. How about January 1st, 2008? We wouldn't be able to take the first pedal and take the first step if it wasn't for our family and the support of our family to make this possible. So Mike, we're about to ride our bikes across the country. How are you feeling? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> now I know what you're saying. It seems like a pretty daunting task. Why do it? Isn't your butt gonna hurt? Well, probably. But repeatedly, we hear that the automobile is the number one contributor of greenhouse gases in the United States. Since Mike and I live in Southern California, the place that kind of gave birth to a culture dependent on cars, we owe it to future generations to experience this journey on bicycles. New Year's Day, 2008. We're getting on our bikes and we're riding across the country. Seems like a good idea for a New Year's, right? Our goals are simple. Make it across the southern tier of the United States from Newport Beach, California to Key West, Florida, and to collect environmental perspective from the regions we visit. Right from the start, we experienced unique challenges. Day one, in particular, proved to be our first major hurdle to overcome. Mike and I had trained for this with a specific amount of weight in mind for the trailers we were going to tow. With everything loaded up, we found ourselves pulling about 75 pounds each. I wondered, is this an impossible goal to meet with a load like this? And before we started the ride, people would ask us, will there be somebody following you in a van or something? You're gonna have a support team, right? When we replied with no, you can imagine the puzzled looks on their faces. Some said we were crazy to be leaving on a cross country trip like this in the middle of winter. We thought that this time of year would bring the best temperatures for an entire experience like this. Some ride it across in two months, and I've even heard of someone doing it in as little as 11 days. Well, this is not a race. We want to meet people in the different regions we visit. And since one of our goals included documenting as many environmental perspectives as possible, we've set four months as a realistic time frame. If all goes as planned, we expect to finish in Key West by late April. The aching in my knees is mounting already, and the frosty winter winds are whipping at my face. Almost, finally, made it to Carbon Canyon. So next turn, we had a couple of setbacks. Uh, took some wrong turns, probably lost about two and a half hours. Day one mile total was embarrassing. We ended up making it to Carbon Canyon from Newport Beach. This put us at 30 whopping miles for day one. Without knowing where exactly we would end up at the end of our first day, we decided to stop at an Indian reservation and inquire as to where we might find a place to camp. Yeah, right. No campsites around. However, the owner has offered up the luxurious accommodations of his horse stables. <laughs> it will do. Uh, I'm watching a horse go poop right now. 
Thank you. Since this is an environmental documentary, I have to backtrack here. We can't leave the Pacific Ocean behind and not discuss Southern California's own environmental challenges. Prior to our departure on New Year's Day, we met with several people to acquire some regional perspective. And I'm standing right now in front of the Santa Ana River. The Santa Ana River is one of the largest watersheds in Southern California. It starts up in Big Bear and it had several tributaries and it goes through probably about 20, 30 cities before it reaches here. We're between Newport Beach and Huntington Beach. The purpose of the Aquarium Pacific's watershed programs, what we've been involved in almost from the beginning of the aquarium, is to teach people that they have a connection with the ocean and the environment around them. By polluting in their own communities, uh, we try to teach them that all of that's going to drain through our urban waterways, through the storm drains, through our, our rivers, uh, and down into the ocean where in the summer time they're going to be down uh, using it for recreation. They don't have that connection. They think pollution that's down at the beach started at the beach. They're not really understanding that it started in their own communities. One of my pet peeves is all this plastic pollution that we have. And Earth Resource has started our campaign against the plastic plague. What we're seeing here is polystyrene, or commonly known as styrofoam, does to our environment. Number one, all plastic products are made from petroleum and natural gas and lots of chemicals such as styrene and therefore do not biodegrade. So this will break apart and break apart, but it will still be plastics. And when an animal ingests it, it will last in its stomach forever. So an animal comes along and he's looking for some food. And unfortunately, he picks up this. And there's a little pit bitty one like this. An ocean literate person is one who understands that he or she is impacted by the ocean no matter where they live and that he or she impacts the ocean no matter where they live. But what happens is these go into the ocean, the fish eat them, and guess who eats the fish? We do. Or maybe other larger animals are eating the fish and we're, we're eating them. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Watershed's relationship with the ocean, animals consuming plastic. You started this thing talking about climate change. What is the point? Because I've noticed that there's a lot of ignorance when it comes to uh, consuming. The point is that so much of this comes back to our life as consumers. Only in recent years have we begun teaching the youth of our country to have a relationship with the waste they create. The styrofoam is bad for the planet. And you, like it or not, you have a legacy that includes a mountainous pile of trash with your name on it. My name's on one too. Every time we throw something away without recycling it, it's adding to our mountain. How big is your mountain? Since this all comes back to life as consumers, our first major destination is Las Vegas, Nevada. Over the next six days, we'd make our way northeast towards the ultimate city of excess. Day three was marked as a special day in history. It was on day three, leaving Apple Valley heading for Barstow, when the weather finally worked in our favor. The wind was at our back, and it helped us complete 40 miles in four and a half hours. And for us, this was a first. We'd make it to the Barstow city limit, but still had about 20 miles to go to get into the city. There was a high chance of rain, so we hoped to get there and inside a nice, warm hotel. Good for you, Fred. Fingers up. Something we quickly learned was that progress on a ride like this was always going to be based on many variables and conditions. The condition of the road, the weather, and what your body would allow you to physically do. 11 more miles to Yermo. I can make 11 miles. Yeah. If I crawl. Really? At some point. Are you dying? My left knee. I'm about to excommunicate my body. Do you want an axe? Everything else is fine. Yeah, I can use an axe. But I'm pretty sure that's the first time we're going to be riding our bikes on an interstate. Whoo, it's going to be pretty freaky.
We're road tripping across the country right now. Okay. We just came from Berkeley, California. You can't swim in the river right by our school because it's so polluted. Uh, you said that they, they issued a citywide ban on like drinking the water. Not like, drink the water. Exactly. But, you know, only, the poor neighborhoods didn't get the notice. <laughs> only, the, only people on the other side of the river did. But yeah, when it rains, it floods and it flows into the, the drinking water, man. It's disgusting. Raining, flooding in the middle of the desert? We were about to find out. 25 miles uphill, they call it the Baker Incline. We'd spend most of the day slowly crawling uphill, waiting to get dumped on. We've been climbing all day, and we still have 18 miles to the state line. Most of that is uphill. We're crossing our first state line by hitching a ride in a truck. I'm pretty sure this counts as cheating. So we're feeling pretty defeated. We feel like we should have been able to do like some celebrating last night because we made it to Nevada. On a cross-country bicycle ride, every day is about progress. So we jumped on our bikes and pedaled towards the Las Vegas Valley. Almost there, 40 miles to go. And we'll be in Vegas, baby. There was no way we were going to be able to make it all the way across the U.S. without the use of an automobile. In fact, on our downhill bomb into the Vegas Valley, um, we had to use a truck. Again, Mike found out the hard way that there is a correct and an incorrect way to clip the trailer onto the bike. While he was gaining trailer weighted downhill speeds, his trailer came unhitched from his bike and threw him into oncoming traffic where he nearly hit a semi truck. Luckily, he was fine, but his bike was not. We'd spend two full days here in the city of Excess staying with my dear Aunt Liz and we'd be fixing our bikes up for the next leg healing the saddle sores, and meeting a couple of different people. But I do, I do love Vegas. I do think that there is a lot, very grand. I mean, everything here is such a large scale that it's hard to put it in true perspective. I mean, without the other points of reference, you really don't know how big this place is. Um, and I cannot even imagine, I mean, talk about conservation and recycling and everything. Cannot even imagine how much waste this place produces. Look at the Bellagio. <laughs> You know, look how much power they're using. Look how much water they're they're wasting every day. Tourists, I mean, the tourist level. And you know, when you're on vacation, people are less likely to be aware or make the efforts to go the extra mile. When you take the ultimate city of excess and place it in a desert that only gets four inches of rain per year, how does that affect the consumption of water for its two million residents? Well, you know, rainfall is, is very sparse here. We'll get about 13 measurable events per year in an average year, many of those being in the, in the trace amounts. Uh, an average year historically will bring about four and a half inches of rainfall, but we can have periods. In fact, we had a period uh, just, just in recent years where we went nine months with no measurable rainfall. And so you, you really can't depend on rainfall to be part of your water supply. You've got to be able to depend on the Colorado River which is, can also be erratic and is shared among many states, and your, your groundwater supplies. This is the kind of environment, like anywhere in the West, where you've got to have some capacity to be able to store water when it's available and then retrieve it when it's not. Since the water supply is so minimal, Southern Nevada Water Authority had to find a way to make some changes. We found the lawns in this valley. People were putting 73 gallons of water per square foot onto their lawn per year. It's the equivalent of about 10 feet of rainfall in a valley that gets just over four inches of rainfall. So it became very clear that a lawn that served no function other than decoration was not a good choice in this valley. If there were one strategy that we would follow here in Southern California to reduce our water use, it would be to change from our green lawns to native vegetation, native landscaping, because that would make the single largest contribution to reducing water use in our homes. When you change your green lawn to native plants that require less water, it's called xeriscaping. And the Southern Nevada Water Authority helps residents by paying for some of the landscaping costs associated with changing out a green lawn. And so we knew it saved anecdotally. I think everybody knew it saved water. How much water did it save? How much money could you put behind it? So we ran five years of research. It was the largest study ever undertaken of its type. We had hundreds of households enrolled in the program. And what we found was that people reduce their water use by 75% on those areas where they change from ornamental turf to other ornamental plantings. 
uh, that told us that we were going to get about 55 to 56 gallons worth of water savings every year for every square foot of turf we could convert. It was time to head back out on the road. We'd say goodbye to Aunt Liz and make our way towards Lake Mead. Something became clearer on the way out of town that day. The Southern Nevada Water Authority takes water conservation very seriously. If the people of the community don't properly use their water, there are fines involved. There go our freedoms, Texan and fattening us again, right? What it represents, though, is rules being set as a result of environmental conditions. Some of humanity's greatest and most powerful civilizations have tragically collapsed because of their mismanagement of water. In Southern Nevada, you have to know you're in a desert and your actions as a consumer of water count. It's not just the people you enforce against, it's also other people knowing that you have the credibility to enforce. And so a lot of people follow the policy, are careful about their ways, simply because they know that you do take it seriously, that you do impose these penalties. And it's not uncommon. You ask anybody in this community, do they know anyone that's ever been notified or received a violation? And, and many people would say, yeah, I know somebody, which makes it very real to everybody. So what do you think, dude? Today we are going to cross the state line. Finally, hopefully, on bicycles, we're going to cross our first stay line first stay without line, cheating first time zone first dam as far as i know that we've crossed we'll cross the newer dam We are um, just outside of Kingsman, Arizona. Behind us, we've got some uh, pretty white mountains. Can you see them there? Some snow on them, yeah? And uh, Mike's coming up here. He had a little stop to shed some layers. It's kind of deceiving. It's real windy, uh, but it gets hot and then it's cold. It's hot and then it's cold. It's, it's, it's a tricky game to play. You want to keep the right temperature for your core because we've been sick the whole time we've been doing this. Dang winter conditions. So anyway, we're off the 40 east, uh, heading eastbound. And uh, yeah, that's where we're at. Just past mile marker 70. Making good time. The road is smooth, and uh, yeah, allowing for some good, good speed. We're on our way to Ash Fork, Arizona, where we're about to meet with a fire ecologist from Northern Arizona University, Dr. Pete Fulet. Fire ecologists study the relationships fire has in different settings. So here we're talking about wildland fires, this can be forest fires, range fires. It took two days to cover 95 miles from Kingman to Ash Fork. Intense uphill climbs put us in removed areas far away from any types of services. Of course, riding in remote areas means camping in remote areas. <laughs> that is, 
if you consider off the side of the interstate, remote. It's probably an obvious answer, but my first question for a fire ecologist is, what's the relationship between global warming and wildfires? Relationship of global warming to wildfires is pretty straightforward in some ways because fires burn best when fuels are dry, when the weather is dry, hot, windy conditions. So in general, as we look at conditions in general becoming warmer, it's more likely that we will have longer fire seasons that start earlier in the spring, go until later in the fall, that fires will be more severe, that they will be larger, um, and in many cases that the effects of large severe fires may be to essentially permanently change landscapes. In the months leading up to the bike ride, fire plagued much of Southern California, including our hometown of Irvine. While I watched these fires burn, I had to ask myself, is it only going to get worse? There are aspects of climate change that are very poorly understood. So it's possible in parts of the world for it to become warmer and wetter, which would perhaps lead to a different kind of fuel situation, a different kind of fire situation. We don't know exactly how it's going to play out. As a result of the scarred landscape that these fires bring, it has another major impact. But perhaps the single most important resource for human society that comes from these high elevation areas is water. And the loss of the reduction in snowpack that's anticipated with global warming and the loss of forests which help to retain snow and help to filter water and release it gradually over the course of a spring and a summer rather than having rapid uh, flashy flooding type events that carry a lot of water downhill in a hurry um, makes a big difference in terms of the ability of these systems to be able to sustain themselves as providers of water. A uh, recent study that came out last year using climate change models to assess the future climate of the southwestern states, Arizona, New Mexico, um, they used 19 different models that range from sort of better scenarios in terms of how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere to worse scenarios. They um, operate under different assumptions and so on, so it's a variety of different ways of looking at how climate might change. But the somewhat depressing conclusion is that they are all uniformly getting more and more negative. In other words, the relationship of precipitation to evaporation keeps getting worse, so it keeps getting drier over the next hundred years. Geez, okay, I get it. All this information makes me twitch. I want to ask some people on the street what they think about a number of environmental issues. For that, I'm thinking the next big city spot, the Phoenix Tempe area. We take three days to make it from Ash Fork to the Phoenix area. A quick stop in Prescott was necessary to fix a broken chain. And then one of the most thrilling days of bike riding would arrive as we sailed down the mountains of Prescott to the Phoenix area. Our, definitely recycle. Our city, our city recycles, and I think it's the city's job to recycle. We lived in other cities where they didn't recycle, and we tried to recycle. It's hard, and I don't fault people for not doing it because it, it takes a lot of effort. I do participate as much as possible. I do recycle, you know, newspaper, empty bill cards, things like that, boxes. They, I think they'll find that most people really want to contribute towards anything we can do to uh, clean up the environment. I think you should turn off the water when you brush your teeth. It's the ripple effect. Do something good and see how far it takes you. Most of us aren't stepping up to go back to 
the consumption levels in the 50s. You know, it's just not happening. Well, if we shorten the life of, of the planet, the humans will be gone too. <laughs> Pro recycle. I mean, I don't see why not. I write on recycled paper and wipe with the same. <laughs> you know, I consider myself a human being that's responsible, and part of that is being an environmentalist. Okay, so it seems like the people of Arizona have some great things to say about a number of environmental issues. But what about here in Phoenix and Tempe? Are there any environmental threats affecting your community? Particularly here in Arizona, where we have a terrible haze. Uh, hovering over us, uh, particularly in the summer and everything. When we have days where they tell you don't go outside and play, our children can't go outside and play some days during the summer because the pollution is so high here. But maybe if people rode their bikes more, the pollution won't be as bad. So, I mean, we're part of the solution. We're trying to do our best and we try to educate everyone else to be on their bike as well and walk and ride a bike, take the bus. Welcome to Tucson, Arizona. We're in an area that can see temperatures hang around 120 degrees during certain times of the year. This desert sees a ton of sun. It makes sense that if you're in business to capture energy created by the sun, then Tucson, Arizona would be a great place to call your home base. Well, my name is Scott Wiedemann. I'm the chief scientist for Global Solar Energy here in Tucson. Tucson is uh, it's got an awful lot of sun, uh, some 250 or 300 sunny days a year. It's got one of the highest solar capture rates uh, in the country, although the entire southwest of the United States, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, uh, Southern California, Utah, are all very you know, sunny states with a lot of potential for solar energy. To give an example, though, that might put it in perspective, if we covered 15% of the state of Arizona with solar panels, that would produce enough energy to power the entire country. This is great news for solar, but get this, solar helps conserve water as well. All the power plants consume water. They blow water through for steam cooling on gas-fired turbines, um, coal-fired plants, all require water cooling, tremendous amounts of water. Nuclear power plants require tremendous amounts of water. It's why they're often located near a river, in fact, or a, a coast. And um, that water consumption is more and more becoming an issue for the developed world. And uh, PV avoids the water consumption for cooling as well. We met up with these guys, Chuck and George, during our time in Tucson. George is a solar panel contractor who installed 96 solar panels on Chuck's house. Chuck recently made the investment in solar. I'm a financial planner, uh -huh. and I did the math on the uh, the economic efficiency of owning solar panels, and I found that it was not possible to economically afford uh, solar panels. That is until he discovered that Tucson Electric Power has a program called Green Watts. Green Watts gives people a chance to make a difference who don't have enough money to invest in solar power. By checking a box on their monthly bill, citizens can donate as little as $2 per month. This money goes directly back out into the community for the development of new renewable energy projects. Like the array we see here behind me at Safford Middle School. Chuck would not have been able to afford his solar panels without the financial aid from TEP. Tucson Electric Power has had one of the world's largest solar power arrays uh, for close to a decade now. We've developed in uh, eastern Arizona an array that has now reached 4.6 megawatts in capacity. In 2006, uh, that array set a world record for energy, solar energy production from a single site photovoltaic array. And a lot of people look to that array in our community and, and uh, become inspired to do for themselves uh, a little bit of uh, solar power at their home or business. So most of the power in Tucson Electric uh, is generated using burning coal. And coal uh, has been a very cheap energy source, very common. It has the disadvantage of, of course, creating greenhouse gas. We all know that. Also some other, you know, chemical, nasty stuff like mercury and some other things that we really just don't want to be inhaling. Still today, greater than 90% of the power that we provide customers is uh, from coal-fired generation. Most of, the generation, most of the generators that we own uh, are coal-fired. Uh, we do have some natural gas in the mix, and uh, that probably accounts for 8 to 
and renewable energy at this point is still less than one percent of our generating mix but we have a new requirement from our corporation commission to increase to greatly increase our use of renewable energy. tucson electric power is recognized internationally for the efforts that they've been making in the areas of alternative energy especially in the areas of solar but if ninety percent of tucson's electricity comes from coal and only one percent of their energy comes from renewable energy sources then i think we need to reconsider some things. the emissions of greenhouse gases grew seventy percent from nineteen seventy to two thousand and four now don't get me wrong tucson electric power is doing a great job at promoting and supporting renewable energy but ninety percent of their energy still comes from coal which can be cleaner in some cases but really it just isn't in most. There is work on clean coal technologies, but it's difficult. And um, it still contains sulfur, arsenic, mercury, a lot of heavy metals. And it's hard to get rid of that completely. That's why it's great that a local teacher is involved with TEP in hey, making sure that the doing? energy we do you burn is used effectively. OK, you know where your stuff is, right? Yeah. With the energy part, we, we look at ways to encourage, in a positive way, teachers and faculty members to turn off lights when they leave a room. Um, today we did energy patrol. We went to every classroom and to see if their lights were on or off. And we got to give them these cards where there was a plus, a, a, a zero, or O, and a check. Mm. The plus sign meant that they were doing okay and that the lights were off and nobody was in. The zero or O means that some of the lights were off and no one was in there, so that's pretty good, but you still need to work on it. And the check is after you've gotten a uh, circle, you, you get to check if you still have the same problem. So at this stage, we just want them to have an understanding of what happens to waste, how they can gather it and recycle it, and it's kind of building a foundation for steps that are going to come later in life. We really don't want them to tackle adult problems right now. We want them to be able to have an influence on what they do in their environments and this will build that foundation for actions they can take later. One of my friends called me up one time and he said, you know, we got this cool Tuesday night thing going on and uh, you should come out. A lot of people come out during the, during the school year and it'd be cool. Uh, cool ride, you know, we haven't really had anything like this in Tucson, so to see something like this emerge is really awesome. And I started coming to the Tuesday night bike rides quite a few months ago when they were still relatively small. Just heard about them from word of mouth and uh, I've been coming ever since. So. You know, we've had anywhere from like, you know, 5 to 70 and I think the most we had was around like 300, 350 people. It's just a fun, cool community ride and it's what Tucson needs for, for the growth of cycling here. Because of the cross-section of people who attend this ride, I, I don't think you'd find a person here who wouldn't include environmental reasons as one of the reasons that they ride a bike. It's, it may not be the chief reason, but everybody in this, in this crowd understands the implications of global warming, for example. I mean, we live in Tucson. Tucson's like ground zero for global warming. And uh, this city is going to have to evolve. And, and I think a lot of the people in this, or in this group of people would tell you that Tucson needs to be a leader in, uh, in the way cities can approach the problems of global warming. And the two, what better way than the Tuesday night bike ride just to show people who don't ride their bikes how fun and easy it can be. Um, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of what goes on on these rides, people ringing their bells when we pass a car and waving to people and saying, you know, come on and join us. It's not like you have to be a good bike rider to come out and have fun here and realize that, you know, you can ride your bike eight miles, which is what usually the, the routes are six to eight miles. And all kinds of people ride these, these rides on one speed cruisers. I mean, it shows people that, you know, you can get around on a bike and it doesn't, you don't have to be, you know, spandex clad racing around and you don't have to look like you know some dorky person right now you can just enjoy cycling and you know a town like Tucson that has the potential to really utilize bicycling as a mode of transportation um, especially to cut down on, on gas consumption and cars I mean uh, you know Tucson has just so much potential to become such a great bicycling friendly city and what a better way to encourage them by creating a great community ride that gets people out on bikes and shows them how much fun it can be to just go from point A to B. 
every ride ends with a game of foot down, which is a game where we ride in a circle and if you put your foot down, you're out of the game. it's a it's a really good natured good hearted game usually until the very end when there are only three or four people left and then they kind of start banging into each other a little bit. On September 26, 1991, a crew of eight Biospherians entered Biosphere 2. Could these eight people sustain life for two years sealed away from the outside world? Well, they did. And when that project completed several years ago, the focus shifted. The really big difference between what was originally done and what is being done now is that you know, we're no longer airtight. We can uh, restrict air movement to very specific locations so we know what comes in and what goes out, but again, no longer concerned with being completely airtight. So watch your head when you come. Think of this place as the largest scale example of nine different habitat settings the world's largest scientific greenhouse. We, we have an equatorial rainforest, a subtropical savanna. We have a mangrove swamp. We have a lower savanna and a subtropical thorn scrub. And then finally, on the far southern end, we have a coastal fog desert. So anybody who thinks they're going to recreate nature outside or create some type of a perfect replica, th there is none, and there probably will never be one. And even when we do research on the outside, we have very little control capabilities, and we don't understand all the interactions. And so, although Biosphere 2 is not a perfect model, it again is this intermediate step. And if you understand um, its advantages, but also what some of those limitations are, um, you can ask some very compelling questions that only can be addressed inside of a facility like this. We can make changes to the carbon dioxide level in here. Um, we can change the amount of moisture that's in here. And in fact, we've taken the rainforest through a 37-day drought to look at how it responds. Uh, the other thing we did is we took it from present day carbon dioxide levels to a level that we may reach in 100 or 150 years and looked at how not just an individual plant but how this collective group of organisms responded to this increase in carbon dioxide or to this decrease in moisture. Most interesting is what Biosphere 2 has learned about plants absorbing greenhouse gases. As you give plants more CO2, they accelerate their uptake of carbon. And many people had thought, well, for a whole group of community or a whole community, it may be a sort of a linear response. But at what point do you reach a saturation point? And what and at what point sort of does it level off or stabilize? And what we found is that once you reach a value of a thousand parts per million, uh, which is a level that we might reach in let's say 120 years or so at our current rate of increase, then there is no longer a positive uptake by the plants. So if you wanted to use plants as a mitigating factor, they'll be very successful up to that point. But then after that, they're no longer going to be an offset factor for you. This water down below mimics the habitat of the coastal Yucatan Peninsula. What has Biosphere 2 learned in the areas of ocean research? But a simple increase in CO2, um, it is a gas that's soluble in water, and so it actually dissolves into the water and makes the ocean more acidic. Um, and what ends up happening is as you make that ocean more acidic, CO2 plus H2O becomes carbonic acid, that carbonic acid reacts with carbonate to create two bicarbonate molecules in the ocean. Well, now this carbonate which is traditionally important for corals to build their hard structure we associate with reefs, um, is no longer available at the same level and is actually reduced. And so regardless of whether you have nutrient overloading, temperature increase, a simple increase from present day to some future levels um, has the potential, and we've shown in our research here, to significantly reduce corals growth. So much so that they may not be able to compete up, compete with this continuous erosion process that's happening as a result of waves, fish, and other components in the um, in the aquatic system itself. So somehow we have to help people connect the dots, so that they will understand how they are impacting the ocean, and the fact that the ocean provides them with enormous resources that could be be lost. Theory and research about greenhouse gases affecting the growth rate of coral in our oceans is interesting and much needed. But I wonder, what are practices that are actually happening? Practices that protect, 
reuse, and honor our planet. Places like this are popping up all over the country. It's called a bicycle co-op. Yeah, you know, bikes very rarely disappear completely. Parts of them break, but so many of the bicycle parts are around forever. In the underground world of Bikus, that's Bicycle Inner Community Art and Salvage, old bikes and their parts arrive from a variety of sources. Yeah, all the bikes down here have all been donated, bikes, parts, that's all what we run off of. Especially being in our location in Tucson here where the weather is generally pretty friendly, especially this time of year, you know. Uh, we got a lot of people that live on their bikes and totally rely on their bikes um, that come down and use the space. That's where all the recycled parts go. Either the bike parts can't be used anymore or um, or if you just have like, so we got so many of certain parts that the overflow will go over into the art area here and then that stuff gets used for um, art projects, like either functional sculpture type stuff. Most heavily used is the community tools area where people can just come in, drop in, you know, and they can work on their bike for as long as they want. We have a work trade program where people can come help out by sorting through these parts and uh, they kind of learn where everything goes and then at the end of uh, the, their work trade hours they can pick out a bike and fix it up. So we also offer a maintenance class which is about a four hour class and that's kind of more for people to have a bike already, just want to kind of learn how to maintain it, learn how to troubleshoot, see when things, are, um, when things are wrong or when things are right and how it's working and how it should be working. I love it. This is reuse in every sense of the word. That just seems so perfect, you know? It's like, <laughs> everything about it. It's like you get to uh, recycle all these bikes that would otherwise be taken to the trash or still be sitting in somebody's yard. Um, you get to teach people how, how it all goes together and you get to see these people, you know, light up when it clicks, you know, and it's like, oh, I get it, you know, and, and it all makes sense. Spending about a week in the southern Arizona area, Tempe and Tucson. We're finally getting out of here. We're heading towards Globe. Now there's a threat of rain tomorrow. It's the first day back in the saddle, and uh, we've got two days of uh, threatening rain that could uh, put a delay in our arrival to see the Apache tribe in uh, San Carlos, Arizona. That's our next major.